you can travel for hours without seeing a cell phone tower or a paved road. Colorado's Gunnison Gorge is a natural paradise. There's no other canyon like it in the United States. Their climates are different, but their concerns are the same. This reminds me of Exxon Valley's oil spill. Alaska and Gulf Coast residents share their encounters with devastating oil spills. Welcome to This American Land. I'm Sharon Collins. On this show, a rugged western playground. Whether you like to hike, fish, raft, or mountain bike, Colorado's Gunnison Gorge is both pristine and protected. Bruce Burkhart has more on this stunning national conservation area. For Josh Kettle, it hardly seems like work. From May through October, he is a river guide on Colorado's Gunnison River, piloting an inflatable raft through the Gunnison Gorge wilderness, located in the heart of the 63,000-acre Gunnison Gorge National Conservation Area. It's so beautiful, and it's, you know, it's one of a kind. There's no other canyon like it in the United States. It's just very wild, rugged. Uh, you know, the river is just amazing. Tons of fish, wildlife. Just a great way to relax. Gold medal trout fishing beneath sheer granite cliffs, white water, wildlife, and spectacular vistas. Gunnison Gorge exists as it has for millennia. Unlike its neighbor to the east, Black Canyon of the Gunnison National Park, Gunnison Gorge is remote and undeveloped. Getting here is not easy, but it does have its benefits. You know, it takes enough planning and a little bit of effort that I think it keeps it from getting overcrowded. The fact that you can go for hours and hours and hours and not see any man-made construction, any other uh, uh, power lines or these kind of things or roads running through here, it's truly a canyon that hasn't changed in eons. Rafting and fishing the inner gorge of the Gunnison River is just one of many options for outdoor recreation within the conservation area. This area was designated as multi-use public land. It's a true Colorado playground, offering easy access activities as well. ATVing, horseback riding, mountain biking, hiking, plus fishing, and if they bring a boat, throw in a boat as well. Miles of single track trails and Jeep roads enable virtually every mode of transportation within the gorge boundary, and more routes are currently under construction. The new Sidewinder trail system will enable visitors to transect nearly the entire conservation area with several options for smaller loops. Regulations segregate users to prevent conflict and to enhance the outdoor experience. And that's what we hear the most of people come out here and they said, this place is only 63,000 acres, but it feels much bigger when you have the opportunity to explore it in a whole lot of different ways. The gorge was added to America's national conservation lands 10 years ago, a system that has blossomed and flourished through the efforts of grassroots citizens groups and volunteers. The idea is to forever protect landscapes that have outstanding natural, cultural and historical value from development or encroachment. Gunnison is a great example of that. This gorge is, is going to remain wild for future generations and I think people generations from now are going to look back at this and be really glad that our generation helped keep this place wild and kept it like it is. For This American Land, I'm Bruce Burkhart. It's gorgeous here. The Gunnison Gorge Wilderness is located within the unique black granite and red sandstone double canyon system of the Gunnison River. The Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic may not seem to have much in common, but the search for oil in both places has created a kinship among residents and a desire to protect both fragile ecosystems. Gary Stryker has the story. This reminds me of Exxon Valley's oil spill. We have many miles of our beaches like this. A lot of our showbirds and our flyaways didn't come back to Point Hope due to this kind of oil activity, oil spill. This is where the Gulf of Mexico meets the Arctic, in the eyes of a man who has seen the devastation that oil spills can cause. 
Earl Kingit is one of four native leaders that traveled thousands of miles from their tribes in Alaska to a very different environment in the Gulf. You can see right on top there. Drawn here by the threat and potential consequences of offshore drilling. Oh, that's disgusting. The group made the trip because exploratory drilling is planned in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas off the coast of northern Alaska. Shell would be the first oil company to drill there. And it says because the Arctic seas are far shallower, an accident like the one in the Gulf would be easier to contain. Not so, say the Alaskans. There's going to be a minimal uh, absorption of the spilled material and it's a very difficult process to respond in a warm climate and it's going to be impossible in the Arctic. Impossible, they say, because conditions in the Arctic are so much more hostile, with rough seas, ice, bitter cold, and only a few months in the year when drilling and emergency operations can even take place. By comparison, the Gulf is accessible and has far more resources on hand. As the Alaskans saw, many fishing, coast guard, and oil industry vessels are available to try to fend off the oil. That would not be the case in the Arctic. A flyover of the Gulf spill area brought the scale of the disaster home and a feeling of kinship with those suffering below. There is a bond because the people have been impacted you know, and oil development, there's always going to be an impact of some sort. There's a chance that some of this will make it if it's not a prolonged exposure. The Alaskans were joined by Michael Dardar, a member of a tribe from coastal Louisiana. He gave them a stark warning. My hopes is that they would go back to their home territory and do whatever they can to make sure that the footprint that the oil industry has there is not expanded, that, uh, that they don't have to, to face the things that we've had to face here. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. The Chukchi Sea is home to about 2,000 polar bears, one-tenth of the world's population. Barbed wire has been the source of sharp battles in the American West, but now there may be a simple solution to meet the needs of migrating wildlife. Gary Stryker has more on what could be friendly fencing. Barbed wire fence. It cuts across private and public land throughout the American West. It's a vital tool for managing livestock but it can be an unintended barrier to migrating wildlife. We mapped um, about 110 miles of fences and of that approximately 90 percent of the fences had some barrier to wildlife moving through them. The Green River Valley Land Trust is leading a five-year campaign to inventory and retrofit up to 500 miles of fence in Wyoming's Green River Valley an area about the size of Delaware, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire combined. How are you, Mayor? <laughs> the nonprofit works with landowners and other partners to provide free installation of wildlife-friendly fencing. The goal is to preserve wildlife migrations, including a path pronghorn antelope have traveled for 6,000 years. The summer range in this particular case for the pronghorn is pretty well protected because it's in Grand Teton National Park. But for that hole to function, you have to be able to get those animals from the summer range to the winter range. And this corridor addresses that need. The park's pronghorn antelopes survive by migrating south to escape deep winter snow. To preserve this movement, the third longest non-avian migration route in the world, the Land Trust is helping landowners modify fencing. They're replacing bottom strands of barbed wire with smooth wire, 16 inches off the ground, making it easier for antelope to pass underneath it. Within hours of um, making the fences more wildlife friendly, the, uh, the antelope are just scurrying under them very rapidly and, and uh, appear to be moving through those corridors a lot easier. 
The work is paid for in part by a million dollar grant from a fund supported by oil and gas drilling. Energy companies pay into the fund to offset environmental impacts from drilling. The region is home to two of the nation's largest natural gas fields. The grant is being matched by others, including outdoor retailer Patagonia, wildlife foundations, and state and federal agencies. The corridor conservation campaign focuses on a different species each year. Next up, an inventory of fencing along migration routes used by mule deer. For This American Land, I'm Gary Stryker. And the antelope play. Pronghorns have roamed the plains and deserts of North America for at least the last million years. Young are born in late May or early June, with about 60% of the births being twins. Thanks for joining us for our look at the natural landscapes, water, and wildlife of this American land. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time. <laughs>